like a, a conversation rather than a lecture is down there. Uh, I was about to, uh, I, I thought that that would be like uh, the paper chase. Somebody was going to call on me to, to brief my case. I was having, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was saying to Vanessa on the way over here, I really enjoyed the prior two sessions, particularly because they gave me a lot to think. However, if uh, economist uh, Roderick at Harvard said that is not a, re usually says, that's usually a, a not reality model. Uh, as I heard them speak, I thought to myself something really interesting. Uh, there's a little quote attributed to Ronald Reagan, which is actually probably not his entirely, and they said, when you face a new market, if he moves, you tax it. If he moves and expands, you regulate it. If he doesn't expand, you subsidize it. And if it gets out of control, enjoy the chaos and profit from it. And I think that that's exactly what we're listening down there. This idea that perhaps we should or we should not regulate something so promising as this that can change the next revolution in our history, literally global history, is almost to me illusory and ludicrous. And particularly from the point of view that economically, legally, and monetarily speaking, there's too much to gain from something like this Unlike the other prior market failures that we had, the dot-com, etc., the right in technology that promises to regulate international trade is too much here. And therefore, we, we cannot but really think that sooner or later, as this infant industry expands and grows, and we see it, uh, should we say, transcend markets, we should not also, which is what we're going to discuss, not only talk about impact, but implications. Right? Everything is a ripple, a rock in a pond. Right? You see those circles, and then those waves eventually crash. The problem is whether those crash become a tsunami after a volcano or an earthquake. And that's exactly what we need to explore. So because of that, we need to talk about international trade. Today, according to the IMF, it's almost 10% higher than during the crisis, 105 and trade keeps expanding and we're now at approximately 62.1% in the trillions of dollars. So what is blockchain going to do to international trade? And this is really very important, the expansion of international trade and what it promises to do to the taxation of trade. And let us not kid ourselves, trade is government intervention of markets. End of story. Let us be honest, right? So what kind of regulation, not whether or not it's regulated, but what kind of regulation will it bring? What are the limits? What are the restrictions? How do you regulate it? Also, we're talking about downstairs, we're talking, and I heard a lot about the United States. It was not until the last few minutes that I actually heard some comments about other countries' implications and impacts. So the question is, will the rest of the world apply our model and say we will not regulate it. For example, in the United States, we plan not to regulate the Internet, and then suddenly we did, right? In one form or another, through sales and use tax, or VAT at the other end, we suddenly are somewhat indirectly regulating the Internet. So what I would like to do now, as you uh, see this illustrious panel here, is to explore that impact to explore what it means to international trade. So first, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask the Professor David uh, Sacco here uh, because in his email he mentioned something very interesting. I read. Let's talk about what is transfer pricing. So this is something very very essential to international trade. So why don't you give us an introduction? Okay. Well, just. Uh, <coughs> to make sure everyone in the room understands what transfer pricing is all about. Uh, transfer pricing involves uh, transactions uh, among related companies uh, uh, where uh, the price that's set is not necessarily the price that would be set by uh, unrelated parties. So the, the idea is if you're a tax planner, uh, and, uh, what, you, what you say is if I have a purchase of property by uh, one related party 
from another related party. Uh, what I want to do is make sure that I, uh, I maximize the amount of income in the lower price jurisdiction, assuming the two entities are in different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I want to uh, maximize the amount of income that's in the uh, lower ta tax uh, jurisdiction compared to what's in the higher tax jurisdiction. Uh, so that if it's manufactured, let's say, in China and it's going to be sold in the United States, uh, I, I determine and I know how much the price, how much it costs to manufacture it, how much it, I'm going to be able to sell it for, so I know the total profit that my integrated uh, multinational company is going to generate, um, I, I try to see to what extent can I either raise the price that's being charged in China so I have more income there, or reduce the price that's being charged in China uh, so that I have more income in the United States, just depending on the specifics of my, uh, my company where the profit is best allocated. Uh, and this kind of, this issue is one that uh, obviously, I first encountered in dealing in the United States, but when I, getting into practice, you discover that most countries realize that this is an issue, and they look to see uh, how to deal with it. And how they deal with it is to come in and audit the uh, company in their jurisdiction and say, uh, normally, you're, you're charging too little or you're paying too much. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and, and what that leads to is... Uh, questions as to how you're going to determine uh, what the price ought to be. Because given that the parties are related, uh, you can't just rely on the price that they set in their contract. Uh, so uh, various uh, principles have been uh, suggested to how uh, the income should be allocated. Uh, we tend to uh, talk uh, initially about arm's length pricing. Uh, where you try to say, well, if they were unrelated, let's look at unrelated companies that uh, buy and sell the same thing. And usually that's, uh, that's a, that tends to be a very profitable uh, exercise for the economists who go through to create the comparables, but it's very difficult to reach consensus necessarily on what those comparables ought to be. Uh, and uh, the result of, of this kind of tax planning, without getting into, we don't need to get any I don't think any of the more details of what other alternatives there are, but uh, the uh, result is that you have uh, what's led to this base of this BEPS project, base erosion and profit shifting, uh, tax planners shifting the income from a high tax to low tax jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, the, the simple solution would be for everyone to agree on one way of allocating profit, uh, which is what the BEPS project hoped to do, and it's it's hoped to do that because so much income is being uh, shifted uh, from one country to another that people recognize that even if they didn't get the best answer for themselves, uh, it was better to get perhaps a uniform answer. The difficulty with getting a uniform answer is that different countries have different strengths and different weaknesses, and they tend to uh, value the things that they're strong in. Uh, uh, more than other countries do, and value less the things that they're uh, not as uh, not as uh, <coughs> uh, efficient at doing. Uh, so, all of, so that's the idea of transfer pricing. That's the problem of transfer pricing. Uh, the idea of uh, fitting it into a uh, a blockchain model is to see whether uh, whether the blockchain can keep track uh, and perhaps allocate uh, the, uh, the, the profits that are generated along the way that the uh, product is moving from its initial creation to, uh, to its final sale. And the, the difficulty reflected in the BEPS project and the difficulty in their reaching a consensus is deciding how that allocation ought to be made. So uh, Dr. Xiaohao introduced like many big concepts, but I think as a practitioner, what it comes down to is that if you're a multinational doing cross border transaction, so you have, you have a widget that's designed in U.S. with components from Canada, maybe assembled in Ireland, sold to your distributor in Italy, you find the third party, and at, at the end you made hundreds of you know, dollars of profit. For those four countries, what should be the profit level? So, so the question of transfer pricing 
is not just in the tax context, in just regular running your businesses, you should care about in each of the you know, territories how much profit you leave behind. But because the supply chain has been complex, um, financial systems you know not adequate up to this point, the transparency and tracking of the values along the way have been difficult. And that's why Dr. Sheffer was saying governments feel, especially non-U.S. governments feel that they're not getting their fair share of the profits. So there, there, there have been initiatives in so-called BATS to make sure there's more transparency on your, you know, we call it value chain. Hey, how do you come up with that $100 profit with your, you know, the supply chain value chain in general? And I think, you know, we in the panel discuss kind of in prepping forward, I think there's some ideas to help both the, the, the companies, the finance professionals who need to track those kind of inner company profits, as well as for the regulators to have a better platform in which these transfer can, you know, transparency can be shared. So, so one, I mean, I'll start with just you know, one idea that, that you know, PwC is working on is the concept of you know, the cost contribution. Hey, how can you demonstrate it to the final Italy tax authorities? Hey, you know, there's five dollars profit in Italy, but other profits appropriately, you know, attributed to Ireland, U.S., and and, and and Mexico is because this was the cost base. This was kind of value add, you know, that went into whether you know manufacturing or services, some activity went into it. So here's a full trail of cost contribution that was done on this kind of sale of widgets in Italy. And I think something like blockchain that is kind of uh, a more platform neutral, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have 10 ERP systems or you know, different, you know, mixed systems, if we can agree on a kind of standard with which we can report on that value transfer pricing, I think certainly that will be transformative for our practice. Okay. I'd say, in my experience, you know, coming from the, the ERP side and then moving into tax, I spent a lot of time with intercompany transactions. It's a really, really ugly process. So if you've got one ERP system, fairly straightforward. They cost contribution modules you can kick in, and you can keep track of everything. When you move into these large multinational enterprises, you have you know, dozens to hundreds of ERP systems, and they're sending transactions back and forth across each other. So just the sheer accounting exercise. One company I know has 600 people trying to tie out the intercompany <coughs> transactions around the world. It's, it's just an unbelievable mess. And then you take the the complexity of trying to figure out what, it, what you know, functions and risks are being done by each uh, particular company in this supply chain, which really is the profit allocation. It's called a value chain. And it takes someone, you know, Giorgio had three, three law degrees and two PhDs. It takes a guy like that to figure it out. It's, it's unbelievable. It's mind-numbing. I've got a headache just talking about it. And that's why we have this whole industry around it. And there's big money at stake. Um, I know uh, some of the India cases, $800 million of controversy. You've got two governments involved trying to work out who gets the profits. You've got a headquarters with probably two subsidiaries underneath. So, you know, you've got five parties in involved in this trying to figure out things that involve $800 million. In one case, $2.4 billion in a pharma case I saw. Um, and then you've got, you know, the... the the Apple ruling, which is not really transfer pricing, it's more anti-competitive, uh, anti-competition, unfair competition, but that's $14 billion. So if you're talking big money here, you're talking hundreds of people involved with these large companies trying to sort things out, um, and fundamentally there's a lack of trust. So the, the, the multinationals don't trust the governments. Bad blood. Uh, the small governments don't trust the big governments. So it's bad blood. So the multinationals are arguing about you know, the methods that they should use to find the true profit. And, and the, the small governments are arguing with the big governments about you know, what's the appropriate methodology. Is it arm's length? That's, you know, that's what everybody's trying to push for. The developed economies are trying to push for that. The, the less developed economies, uh, even the, the BRICS, they're pushing for special factors in China. Access to our market means companies in China should make more money. We have 400 million, you know, um, middle uh, class consumers. You want access to that, you pay, you make more profit. That's why. Uh, Brazil, they're saying, well, you know, we're mostly a commodity. Uh, why don't you just go look on the commodity exchange, price it on the commodity exchange. It's right there. We don't need all this fancy arm's length principle stuff. Um, so you've got governments who don't trust each other. You've got co 
companies who don't trust governments. You've got this trust issue. And so I don't think we know what it looks like yet. Uh, but we've got kind of an Apollo 13 problem, yeah. and, and, and the problem is, you know, how could it... 11 or 13? <laughs> <laughs> Apollo, yeah, Apollo 11, yeah. exactly. Thank you. We don't want to go down in flames and yeah. you know, having to rescue ourselves. <laughs> so we've got this trust engine, and we've got this trust problem, and I think we're here trying to figure out how the two can come together. Uh, and, you know, we've got thoughts. We've got, you know, some duct tape and some trying to get the, you know, the Apollo to have more oxygen so we don't die, right? Because it, it, it is really a mess. And so we've got all these materials on the table and we're trying to put them together in a way that makes sense. And I don't think anyone knows what that looks like yet. I think the first foray we're thinking for transfer pricing is more of a private blockchain as a foundation. So, so you know, David alluded to, it, it's just uh, quite a mess and a lot of manual process to keep track of, you know, computer accounting. So, for example, I mean, there are many, many uh, uh, cases out there where a company has been hit with uh, material weaknesses and significant deficiency under financial audit because they did not have good inner company accounting, you know, in control. So, so we know a technology company, uh, when they sell, like, a, a game, you know, or software, they need to pay, like, royalty to you know, some third party. It could be a game character, like, you know, other movie character. Well, you know, when they were selling it, uh, there were, you know, the European subsidiaries, you know, kind of paying the royalties to U.S., but U.S. was not recording that royalty properly on their books. So there's a mismatch of the income and expenses in two jurisdictions. Huge amounts has a, like, net, you know, tax impact. So the financial auditors, you know, catch it and hit with it. So I think just having yet yeah, that foundational technology that, Automates. Hey, once I record something in a company account, I pay royalty. It gets locked in on both subsidiaries. You know, it's trade. You know, you know, completely traceable. You cannot, you know, play accounting games because oh, I want to manage my, you know, the income level a little bit or you know, delay the timing so recognize next year. So there are a lot of kind of. So I think there was a kind of good actor, bad actor. So the bad behaviors in accounting. Uh, certainly, uh, especially in, in a company accounting where a lot of companies think, well, as long as I made my $100, I don't care whether it sits in Italy or whether it's in Ireland. I think a lot of those bad habits can go away with a more standardized kind of uh, private uh, uh, blockchain solution. And it doesn't require, you know, investing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Hopefully, <laughs> it won't require investing hundreds of millions of dollars in, like, you know, ERP, you know, ERP systems or you know, doing a global rollout of financial system that's really costly. So. Hopefully, this decentralized kind of private, you know, blockchain is something that people are looking at. Notice that uh, there, there is a, a, a conflict that's created between what the people on the business side want to do and what the tax planners want to do, Absolutely. which is to say that on the business side, people want the accounting to show that wherever they are is generating the profit. The tax planners come in and say, you know, we'll tell you where we think the profit ought to be. <laughs> and the, the, the blockchain technology, if, it were, if it's implemented, would ideally would fix whatever the result is beforehand rather than uh, uh, people trying to manipulate it afterwards. That's a very, very good idea. For those of you uh, who are not very familiar with the intricacies of transfer pricing, you need to consider that when the measurement of prices along a associated or affiliated group called a control group is measured, you have to do it under certain pronounced and well-prescripted pricing methods that already exist. And uh, you have guidelines, both that are domestic and national laws, and you have guidelines that are international, such as the OECD International Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Those methods, those pricing methods are very, they're econometrics. They're, they're measured accordingly to industry, the type of profit, etc. So if you really think about it, there are two standards to measure that. One you already heard is a standard, international standard, called the arm's length standard or the arm's length range. The other one has a particular detail, which doesn't exist, many people would like to exist, it's called the formulary apportionment, which is made under cer certain factors. And my question to the panel here, as a real consideration is, if moving to the blockchain 
with all of these contracts, safeguards, and protocols, is that a sort of formulary apportionment in the end? I mean, I'll start and I think it is, hopefully, it is independent of the blockchain technology, whether governments adopt arms like pricing or, you know, formulary apportionment. Uh, again, is one way to think about it is kind of arms like price tends to be transactional. So, so buy type of sales, provision of services, you know, or financial transaction like in a company loans or whatnot. There's you know, like rules as as uh, David mentioned. You, you need to follow to make sure that it's priced appropriately. So it's kind of very transactional view. But when we go to formula apportionment, which many governments are really seeking, many non-U.S. governments are really <laughs> exactly. seeking. It's saying that, well, we have all these, like, you know, uh, workers in India. We have all these customers in China by headcount or by, you know, employees, some other measure. Don't we deserve a greater portion, you know, uh, you know a portion of the profit? But it's by nature then you need to kind of aggregate, kind of you know, almost like an income tax method, right? Like state apportionment is probably a common example. Hey, <coughs> we'll look at the result after a year, what you made. Like throughout your you know global chain, and we say based on metrics that we like, you know, let's you know sign you know the the, the profit reporting there. Uh, I think that pressure on the regulation, um, hopefully, so most companies want to stay on what's been around for thirty years transaction method. What I see a blockchain can do to help is that provide more transparency and more like a real time checking of the arm's length range. So that you can tell China and Brazil, hey, you know, we have these set of transactions that was done on this pricing markup, cost plus, it was based on maybe uh, comparing to the like public blockchain transaction. Hey, when you did third party transaction of sales of good, this was the range, you know, profit that was made, and you know, compared to that, we our transactions are comparable. So hopefully from what I see is that blockchain can help kind of almost fight against or push again away from the called arbitrary formula of apportionment and kind of really keep more robust the arm's length standard that's been around for you know 30 years of a trend of pricing regime. Yeah, I, I, I don't think a new technology is going to influence the tax policy makers. Uh, so this technology may help institute the policies, but you know the, the policy makers are Quite frankly, ignorant of technology, and they should be. Uh, they're trying. Uh, to, a regulator <laughs> but they're trying to, you know, adopt policies that make sense at the level they're operating. These are global, you know, regulators, uh, the OECD, the United Nations, right? And so they're going to do policies that, you know, as the G20 is asking them to do, they're going to do, you know, pro-growth uh, tax policies that help reduce the uncertainty. Uh, of the you know the enterprises so that they can spur growth in the economy, so that that's the level that they're talking about. And if we can help make that happen as a you know blockchain technology community, then there's a great fit for us. And if we can't, then you know coming and saying blockchain is going to change tax policy, that, that's not a discussion you can have with them. Right? You're you're talking Martian to them, they, and they don't really want to hear it. Um, so I think that we have to fit into the policies rather than try to modify the policies. And I guess the last thing I'd say is, as I look at these supply chain providence, the Walmart China thing, or if I look at the IBM Merce thing, if I, you know, if I look at the, you know, it was at Microsoft, who's announced supply chain initiatives as well, and people piling in together. I look at that and I say, can we leverage those? Right? If you're doing the supply chain, sure, have providence of your, your inputs. You know, know where the, the food's good, know where the parts came from. Uh, yeah, sure, have the ability to, to factor the letters of credit and the export financing and all the financial side. Um, sure, hook it into your manufacturing system so you can understand the next amount of widgets you need to build. Oh, by the way, let's go talk about tax and customs, right? Let's hook it in there. So it's, if you look at the whole... VAT. VAT. <laughs> you look at the whole supply chain, you're like, well, there's a white space, right? Let's, let's go ahead and hook tax and customs into these projects because you're doing it anyway. You're exposing the supply chain. It should, it, it should be appreciated. Obviously, the the, the goal of the, all the countries would be to reach some uniform decision as to how the uh, transfer pricing ought to be done. And the 
you'd think that given that there are really uh, uh, countries with different concerns, they couldn't reach any kind of consensus. Uh, the, the reason that it, it's viewed as least possible to do so is that, uh, as I alluded to before, uh, everyone recognizes that there's a substantial amount of uh, tax that simply is not being collected anywhere. Basically, you know, uh, 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 income that appears to be generated by in no country. Uh, and everyone recognizes that it's generated somewhere. And that kind of allows for the, uh, the, for the possibility that by reaching a consensus, uh, even though the particular decisions reached won't be ideal for each country, by, if, if it's possible to pull in the additional uh, amounts that are not being collected at all currently, it will finance basically the, a, a change to a uniform to a uniform view. And to the extent, you know, to the extent blockchain allows you to uh, to see what, what what has happened and, and where things have gone, that is uh, uh, that would support a kind of the kind of solution that people are looking to. Uh, as most of you know, uh, transfer pricing is divided into different phases, and one of them is called the operational transfer pricing, the other one is more economic, and the other one has to do more with the adversarial and international perspective of how these pricing methods, when disputed, create certain type of, um, of controversies. So asking the panel is, where would blockchain fit more, in the economic side of price method selection, or on the operational side with international accounting, etc. I mean, certainly we believe the uh, first application of the blockchain will be operational. So, so certainly keeping kind of uh, uh, traceability, transparency of your you know, intra-firm trade, again, the value chain you know, across you know, four countries, that's been very time-consuming, uh, the manual effort within the, you know, all the multinationals. So certainly, initial benefit, we believe, will be on the kind of operational side. But I think, you know, I'd love to get the panelist view is that, you know, in order for that, I think that will be the foundational. As, you know, right before you can kind of have a, a smoother compliance and uh, audit process, controversy process, you need to have a great, like, record, right? So, so certainly, for your, you know, internally as a company, have a great record traceability, you know, through multinational, how the transactions occur. So it is a foundational piece of you know, dealing with any economic testing or compliance. But certainly, you know, would that be enough for governments to to accept as a starting point? You know, love to get your thoughts. You know. Well, I mean, the, 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 it, 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 with, with the blockchain in place, the question is what's going to go into the into the into the blocks and and. and that's going to be determined if it, if it can if it can be determined by consensus. It's going to be determined by the economic considerations, uh, at which you know the, the point is without the operational, uh, the economic considerations are not as valuable. Uh, with uh, ideally with the operational and the and some something like an economic consensus, you you reach a, a, a system that would be functional. Yeah, I, I wonder whether there's any play for the blockchain. Um, there's certain characteristics of blockchain that make it appealing in, in use cases, and I'm still searching for the use case here. Again, I have that, that concept of trust and the lack thereof between these players, um, but it's not clear to me how, for example, using the blockchain to reconcile intercompany transactions, based on my experience at ERPs, makes no sense at all. Right? Um, there's better ways of doing it. You don't need a blockchain. And there's companies, that's all they do. That's their, their business. They reconcile their company business products, software products. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm still at that Apollo 13 stage that I'm, I've got, I see the duct tape, I see the, you know, the air duct, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how it all comes together. I think interesting POCs to, to see if, you know, my assumption that there's better ways of doing it with other technologies or whether blockchain is the magic bullet that helps reconcile their company transactions across multiple ERPs. I, I just don't know. I, I do know that we've got to figure out whether uh, the trust um, protocol can help the governments trust other governments and the companies uh, trust the governments because it's, it's a real crisis right now. 
It is, and on a related question about international accounting standards, would this work more with the current, current disparate gap systems among countries, or more with an IFRS and interna international financial reporting standards? How would that? How would how would you look at that in relation to blockchain? No, I mean again, I think. Blockchain is just a platform technology with a more, again, traceable, transparent detail. I think, as we mentioned in the sessions earlier, there's always room for practitioner with domain knowledge to make judgment calls on, you know, revenue, cost accounting, you know, the valuations. I don't think that changes with, with blockchain. I think, okay. you know, once things, you know, again, you be able to trace, you know, if you make some some accounting judgment on revenue recognition, I mean, hopefully that you could trace them easier through something like blockchain, so that there's better traceability and you can support your argument. But again, you know, as I said, you you still need Tom Cruise to make judgment call on whether you know make a call this way or not on the minority report. So I think that accounting standard it will always be kind of principle based that you know practitioners and government authorities need to interpret on. So let's shift our attention to another side of indirect taxation. As you know, transfer pricing, although it is transactional, is more considered part of direct taxation. Although it is actually transactional and it boggles the mind because its foundation is actually more within that uh, that domain. But looking at value added tax. Notice we didn't say sales and use tax. That's a complete different animal. Uh, but looking at a global VAP <laughs> and looking at the digital revolution that is going on, also known as the digital economy, uh, how would blockchain play an intricate role in tracing VAT transactions? Well, let me set the stage. So um, global GDP, 80 trillion. Um, total amount of indirect tax, that's non-income tax, basically think of it that way, uh, which includes the U.S., about five trillion. Uh, take the U.S. out, you're probably three and a half to four. Of that, the EU did a study and said uh, we're 14 percent short. There's 14 percent of it that disappears. So if you gross that up, maybe it's six trillion in total because there's a trillion missing. Okay, so you've got a trillion dollars of that revenue missing. Uh, you've got studies of money laundering and um, invoice fraud. So basically, if I'm in a country where I want to get the money out and I've got an inability to do so, and, you know, I'm basically, a, you know, maybe I run the country and I want to take my money and get it out of the country, but I don't want people to know that I'm moving my money out of the country. Uh, so there's this thing called invoice fraud where you create a company over in Switzerland and you sell them, you know, these glasses for a million dollars, right? So the invoice shows up on one side as, as you know, twenty dollars for a pair of glasses makes sense. On the other side, it shows up as a million dollars, you know. And so the million dollars gets moved, and the invoices don't match. So there's, you know, a trillion dollars is what I've seen. So you've got a couple trillion dollars here between the fraud and the, you know, which is basically, you know, in the VAT world, you you can as a new company you can file and say it's input minus output. So that's the difference. Value added is uh, basically output minus input. That's kind of like your profit, and that's what you get taxed on. But they don't ask you to reconcile those two and pay the taxes. They actually, when you buy inputs, they give you credit. They'll actually pay you. It's kind of like start funding. Right? You create a new company, you buy some stuff. Well, there's my inputs. You file your return, and they actually, government actually pays you. So you're getting money into your coffers before you've actually really, really sold much. So what happens is companies are created, they say, I bought a bunch of stuff, they get the money, and they run. Right? It's called carousel fraud. So that's a big part of the fraud. So you've got these dynamics in the VAT world where you've got a ton of fraud. Even in the most developed economies of the EU, you've got 14%, $250 million, I think, uh, where you've got you know, large numbers at stake. So if the blockchain can help, create a quid pro quo with the governments and say, we'll help remove the fraud, we'll help get rid of the, you know, both the carousel fraud and the invoice fraud, and maybe some other types of fraud, like missing trader, where, you know, the, the restaurants who have, not all transactions make it into the ledger, uh, you know, money goes right in the pocket, 
for example. So that's a big part of fraud. If you could explain to the governments how the blockchain will help remove that, then I think there's a win-win. And in the VAT world, the governments mandate how things are going to work. Right? Uh, it's like here's your system, you know, here's your return, here's your you know. If they can accept that there's benefit for them, perhaps they'll mandate it in a way. And the and the the the, the, the promise of uh, of uh, blockchain in this area, which is it, and people are actually discussing it in much more closely to the real world than in, in the transfer pricing at the moment, I think, That's right. is that um, if, if transactions, if, if the government is informed of transactions as they occur, uh, which is viewed as, as possible, uh, the government can uh, potentially analyze what's going on and it's uh, hoped uh, with uh, kind of artificial intelligence sorts of uh, analyses to pinpoint a lot more quickly what the suspect transactions are. And the possibility of doing that uh, changes the uh, time between a suspect transaction and when it's identified from a matter of months to potentially a matter of, uh, of, of minutes. Uh, obviously, this is the ideal. Uh, it hasn't been put into, into place yet. But as I say, there, there are actual jurisdictions that are considering using using blockchain technology to keep track of that. And in theory, the idea is it would go both ways. You both, uh, the governments could, in theory, collect the taxes as the transactions are occurring, if you imagine transactions occurring, uh, you know, electronically. Uh, and in theory, it would also, uh, it would also uh, refund that, because that's, that's part of the VAT system, both the, uh, the credit and the debit side. Um, now, whether they'd want to give the refunds as quickly as they make the collections was a question that uh, uh, when, when it actually gets to a practical uh, area, I think they'll be confronting because although there are these ideals that using artificial intelligence, they'll be able to identify uh, suspect transactions that obviously won't happen instantaneously and uh, money can move instantaneously out of the jurisdiction. And that raises an interesting question on kind of privacy of your intra-firm transaction because VAT and transfer pricing oftentimes is related because yeah. any intra-firm trade, so the, 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 the early example of your widget, your supply chain, you also have to comply from VAT perspective. And the valuation of VAT is really driven by transfer pricing as well as the customs. So, so whether you're buying from third parties or whether you're buying from one of your subsidiaries, the VAT regime applies. Now, as Dr. Sheffield said, well, hey, let's say, you know, government saying we need transparency, real-time monitoring of those transactions, then you're, in essence, you know, let's say for blockchain, I mean, you probably would have the ability to expose your transactions to, you know, public and the authorities to let you know what kind of transactions you're, you're doing. But at the same time, well, if that information, transaction to your, your supply chain, if your competitor has that information, you know, does that give them an advantage because they can now also monitor, if it's a public data, they can monitor what you're doing with your supply chain. So, so there are a lot of questions of policy and, and privacy and, and regulation. I mean, we're just, you know, you know scratching the surface on, but, but certainly um, that's why they put the panel together because there's kind of a relation between kind of EAT transaction and then the, the transfer pricing value well, you have to leave something behind, right? <laughs> you know that? In, uh, in science, if you want to move forward, you always have to live, leave something behind. Given that, uh, whenever you the greater amount of transparency will usually have an impact on privacy, on confidentiality. And the question, both economic and legal, is what is the trend? And uh, that is really what, what perhaps blockchain can really explore and fix more perhaps than any other, uh, any other artificial system. But, but there's something else, please. Uh, in taxation, one of the things that we have to understand is that it's, it's becoming, this digital economy is growing. Whether it'll be on the indirect side or direct side, on the transfer pricing side, it is now the phenomena of the attribution of profit to jurisdiction in both 
direct and indirect taxation. So the question that we have to look at is how, as you were saying earlier, Dr. Shackel, how can attribution of profit to jurisdiction, both in VAT and in transfer pricing, be, should we say, helped more by blockchain? And particularly, I may say, to developing countries, right? Because right now, they're being left out of a lot of that, of that cash cow. Well, I, I, uh, I, I, my understanding of how blockchain technologies can be implemented uh, it leaves open the question as to how much, uh, how, how much of what's out there is public as opposed to private. In other words, um, if you if you're collecting that uh, in a, a blockchain system, the government wants to have the ability to see everything that's going on, but whether whether every you know whether it's like Bitcoin where everyone else can see what's happening, or whether uh, their ability to uh, the ability of the public as a whole to uh, see what else is happening and know who, who the players are uh, could be different. In other words, the government wants to know who the buyers and sellers are. The public may simply know that a purchase has occurred, but as far as the players, it could be anonymous. Uh, the there is, a, 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 unfortunately, another aspect of this, which is if the, and this arrives in the transfer pricing area also, where <clears throat> the SPEPS project is leading to uh, the uh, information being provided to governments, uh, United States companies at least, uh, that feel their own government would not do anything like this, but suspect that other governments might use the information they collect uh, to inform uh, competitors as to what, uh, as to the, the otherwise uh, private details of their government, of their uh, corporate uh, organizations and transactions are all about. If this happens, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing in the kind of information that's filed with um, in the transfer pricing area, which is significant to how many employees we have, how much capital, and how much sales, and so on. But if you go, in, if you can actually find out your competitors' sales, uh, identifying them the way the government would know uh, the danger of the loss of, uh, of uh, privacy and anonymity would be much more severe. I mean, think of a case where Microsoft has to, we're in Microsoft, the market has to, you know, dis uh, disclose all their transactions for Google to see, you know, for, you know, for Apple to see. Uh, I mean, that's Actually, even without blockchain, that's one of the concerns that, that the market measures have in the evolving taxing authorities. But I'll come back to one thing uh, George mentioned before. The, from the like, developing countries, so, there, so you know, tax, bigger countries, <coughs> bigger tax authorities, they can kind of enforce, you know, put in more agents out there, enforcement, collect more tax revenue, where third parties, you know, uh, the developing countries have been kind of falling behind. I mean, potentially could, if, if you know, somehow something like blockchain gets adopted as a global standard, would that put governments in more equal footing? So it's more decentralized technology, hopefully less costly to adopt. So without having to invest in a lot of you know infrastructure for smaller countries to to get transparency and, and auditability, could that help developing country? I mean, I think hypothesis makes sense, but I think uh, and an example I use in other discussions is that you know how some countries like skip landline internet and just went straight to mobile because you know it was easier, cheaper to set up cell towers than you know lay you know miles and miles of cable. I mean, could that be a possibility where blockchain give that that flexibility option for developing country? I mean, and did that just spend one of many many questions to be explored in the future? Yeah, I think you're right. I think the leapfrog potential is there for the developing economies, some of which are already capturing every transaction. Rwanda, for example, captures every business transaction in a secure manner into a central database. And the reason they do it is they're like, look, we had a genocide. Right? We started from scratch. And we're not going to lay in old policies designed you know, in the Bretton Woods era you know, or even earlier. We're going to go to the latest thing. Um, I talked to the former prime minister of Haiti at the Ethereal conference. He's the, the same way. You know, we had we had a you know a horrible natural disaster, and it, uh, the building that had our records was wiped out. We don't have any records, so yeah, we're going to jump to the next thing. There's, you know, where this crisis takes place, there's opportunity, uh, not to be crass about it, but there's opportunity to bring people 
you know, into the modern age and make a better system than existed before. I think you're going to see, uh, unfortunately, Illinois. <coughs> Illinois is in a crisis, right? It's, it's, it's you know, uh, Connecticut's not far behind. There are other states. Puerto Rico's already Puerto Rico, hit, the, yeah. hit the wall, right? So these governments are very clear that they, they need more revenue. And if you can get rid of the fraud and you can speed up the payments, that's very lucrative to them um, in a crisis, right? In a local storm. So I think you're going to see this in the VAT, the sales and use tax in VAT. In the indirect space, I think you're going to see a lot of momentum to uh, use this technology to you know, make the money flow to the governments more and faster. Question. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, I certainly see on a business to business, peer to peer sort of transactions being recorded in the blockchain. But I mean, in this, I don't want to get into the. the Technology question, but I mean, as far as like when you were saying earlier about like the pizza chains that basically have nothing but cash. I mean, I don't really see us anytime in the near future being blockchain being, being ready for us to record our daily transactions. But maybe you could put a floor on it, and you know, that that amount of transaction above have to be reported on the blockchain or something like that. Well, the private chains are pretty fast. I mean, I saw last month ten thousand transactions in a second on quarter. Yeah. Right. So don't think, you know, like Ethereum or blockchain. Like 260,000 transactions in a, in, you know, in, I mean, sure. so it's really... It's but like you can replicate that speed yeah. if you have very few nodes, mm -hmm. right? You have like one mining node because you trust it, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, if you're a distributed public chain, yeah, no way, right? You're years and years away. But if you're a private chain, it's just a computer network. Right? But, okay, and, and, and I don't want to, but if we did that, though, are we, is it blockchain anymore? If you had one node then you're going back to basically having a very centralized ledger instead of a yeah. decentralized and, ledger. And that's why Rwanda doesn't use the blockchain. It right. uses you know, public key encryption and an anti-zapper device attached to a POS system that sends it to a traditional database and the government. Right. right? So you know, you don't have the consensus mechanism. You don't have the peer-to-peer -peer thing. So maybe it's not really blockchain. Maybe it's just digital encryption of every transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Now, the payment side, hmm, that might be where the blockchain fits in. Well, quick question. There's many people who say look, the issue about scalability, right, for blockchain, right? And that's been going on for years. The debate's getting really heat up, political. But then some people are taking a position, well, you could do whatever you want. You can make it two megabytes, right, the block. Yeah. But it's still not sustainable because more and more transactions are increasing every day. And they're saying, but well, you've got to break the ecosystem even further down. And one example they brought up, look at a startup, Israeli company, who started the blockchain in Tel Aviv, and it's spread in, and now it's in one city, Manchester, another city in the UK, where you've got communities who are using the blockchain to help the small merchants, because they don't have to pay the big uh, visa fees, right? So they're saying that this smaller ecosystem is actually taking off. What's your opinion on that? I think that makes total sense. Yeah. I, mean, I remember <laughs> you know, being at Cornell, there was Ithaca coin, which was a local, you know, it wasn't a cryptocurrency, it was just a local coin that you could use physically to go around and buy stuff to keep the money in the community. I, I think the blockchain, you know, kind of, uh, I subscribe to a site, I think it's called uh, Nextdoor. And, you know, it's our community, it's our little neighborhood, and we share, hey, you know, the trash wasn't picked up, or who's got a good roofer type of stuff. I could see that it's totally integrating the blockchain. You have these little inner community uh, you know, tokens that help keep the money local. I think that makes sense. And I think questions always going to, it's going to be standard, question of standard. I mean, if we think it's bottoms of kind of, kind of you know, private, like a, you know, communities of private uh, blockchain, you know, especially for you know, multinationals to use, will be kind of the first foray. And then they'll just like our graph, they have to come to some standards on what you know what's included in the block for finish reporting and supply chain perspective. Mm -hmm. But you know it's not going to be top down implementation. They'll say, hey, these are standard for blockchain, you know, transfer pricing, blockchain financial you know, system, and companies can adopt, you know, whatever kind of kind of makes sense. Have a question. Uh, that was a question. Can we back? You know, uh, so so uh, I'm going to tell you this only to help frame the question. I'm the CFO for Pactum. So I would push back on some of what you said is going to take years to get there, but I can't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, what I we're doing you. for Bill and Linda Gates and DHS is a different thing. Right. There's also research on it. I'm interested in the fact that as a practitioner, the, 
cost to implement all these things on top of the ERP system, on top of everything else. And so I'm actually looking at technologies where we take the blockchain for implementing all these things, uh, because we also do multinational business, uh, also looking at it to generate liquidity. So has there been any discussion about what's the, if I have to implement this thing, this, this new technology, what benefits can I use to pay off the cost of it so I don't end up back at the Sarbanes-Oxley quandary of yet more regulation and my profits get drifted away in SGNA? Sorry, I'm a little heated on that. Have you been through Ringer? Any thoughts? I mean, I think it's only directional and hypothesis. I mean, you know, you've heard of like like billion dollar ERP implementation. Could that go away with a thinner financial system? Because a lot of the reckon a lot of reconciliation and control we're saying will be built into blockchain. So would that make you know the, the transaction recording as of the ERP kind of go away a lot? Again, it's only hypothesis. So that that um, we're saying that it will be certainly downward direction to implement kind of functioning uh, the encrypted transparent financial system using blockchain, but it's still only a hypothesis. You can't fix internal controls. <laughs> right. Right. But, but the recording, so certainly recording and reporting of the transaction should be fully automated and you know, unbreakable. So. I have been informed that we yep. are overdue, so we have enough time for all your questions. Oh, okay. I'll make it clear. Is the ER, ERP systems not doing digital encryptions because it's just costly for them? Why are ERP um, systems? So I was in the GL group years ago. Um, nobody asked for it. <laughs> yeah. so there's no demand. Yeah. You have a system administrator, you assume that he's not a crook. Right? Your sysadmin password is not given out. So you, know, you have a couple people, you trust them. And so they also have, you know, record count, so 101, 102, 103, and you know, if the auditor finds that there's a missing invoice number, it's a sequence, they're like, hey, there's a problem here. So it's, it's, you know, it's made to be a little bit difficult. You could hypothetically change things, but you basically trust your people. Then SAP, for example, is kind of adopting blockchain. So ERP is like kind of getting on that, hey, a business model may be impacted you know, by this technology. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. We'll be around and we can interact more. Thank you. <laughs>